three, two, one. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Dave. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And what a gorgeous evening it is out there. I know. I'm in a t-shirt. I'm clammy. <laughs> it's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just give us a quick run through of what you'll be talking about this evening. Well, effectively, um, I thought after the quick brief I did that some people may remember back in March now um, on the post-Brexit changes, um, uh, I thought I would just refresh everybody on the basics of flying abroad. Um, there's a lot of confusion out there, I guess, um, helped not a little bit by um, some of the Brexit changes, some of the licensing changes that are that have been happening recently so the aim for tonight is really start from the very basics um mm -hmm. give people the information they need to easily and legally fly outside of the uk um using france as an example but actually also to fly inside the uk in the special case of northern ireland so that's kind of the plan for tonight fantastic good well yeah a few people came up to us at the la rally and were asking what the deal is with flying to France at the moment because they weren't quite sure. So um, hopefully some people will find this very interesting. And good evening to Michael Ward in the comments. Good to see you Hi, here. Michael. Right. Uh, I will share your screen now, Dave, and disappear. If you are interested and have any comments and questions for Dave, pop them in the comments and we can either deal with them at the end or deal with them as we go through. Okay. Thanks, Johnny. Um, thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining me and Flyer again um, to talk about the basics of flying overseas. Um, it really is the basics. Um, so uh, there may be a little bit of granny sucking eggs in this. Um, I hope not. Um, but please do put up with me um, if some of this is something you already know. Hopefully there will be some gems in this. The talk is really based around an assumption of VFR operations and UK issued licenses. That's important, which we'll come to that in a minute. Um, but the majority of what I'm going to say is valid for people with, the, with an IR as well. As I say, uh, I will focus mainly on flying to France um, just to sort of get the themes across. Um, but I will touch on the differences if you intend to fly to, let's say, the Channel Islands or Northern Ireland, Isle of Man or ERA, the so-called... Um, common travel area and there's more information that goes into a little bit more depth about those destinations uh, in some material which I'll share you can download later on um, I've simplified things only a little in a couple of places um, really to pass on information to you in a way that can be assimilated I think the purist may take me to task on a couple of occasions but actually what I'm going to tell you is to allow you to do the right thing you may over deliver, if you wish, um, to some of the uh, some of the authorities. But it's fail safe, I think, the way that I've um, spoken about it. I've also got a couple of slides at the end, given that we're living in a time of COVID, um, about the current COVID rules. Um, I'm going to limit to what I say there about travel between the UK and France, um, partly because of time, but partly because there are there is some really decent information um, already out there that other people have pulled together, and I'll, I'll point you at that later on. Um, one in particular by Carl Meek from the Flyer Forum, which is really good. And this presentation, um, it's, it, we rattle through it, um, but I'll provide a link to all of the slides in this presentation, as well as that wider material that I mentioned uh, at the end. And um, I'll also put it in the comments once we're done. Right. Uh, why should you listen to me? Um, well, mainly, I hope, uh, because I've been through a circle of confusion before you. Um, it's not straightforward. So I made some notes um, to help myself out, which I then thought would be a pity if I didn't share. Um, I've also had a lot of help and shared information from many people over the years. Um, including names that you will recognize from the forum. So Irv Lee, Carl Meek, Donald Walker. But of course, any errors in this down to me. There are many opinions about what is right. Um, arguably, what area of aviation is that not true? But so far as I'm available, every, uh, able to, everything I tell you tonight has been verified with appropriate official information from the AIPs and elsewhere. 
many people, and for years I was absolutely one of them, don't fly outside of the UK, even though we may really want to, because it all just seems too difficult. One day I sat down with a cold towel on my head, used information from, well, Pooley's as it was, um, which was accurate, but not remotely easy to assimilate. And I worked it all out. And then an enormous bright light bulb came on. But that's easy. Why haven't I done this before? Since then, I've travelled into Europe quite a bit, um, including one excellent trip in 2019 before the shutters came down, leading a formation of two aircraft, thanks to the owner, via Poland, um, uh, via the scenic route. That was 10 countries in five days, with stops in Budapest, Bled in Slovenia, Venice, lovely, Turin, uh, Alpine Crossing, also very lovely, uh, and then southern Germany and home. Um, some of you might think that I only put this map up here for bragging rights. Um, it's a bit unlikely, don't you think? Anyway, the point is, get over that first hurdle, the channel, and raging, ranging, uh, maybe raging, but ranging more widely into Europe is certainly doable for you from there. It is even easier than you think, um, but that's the subject of a future talk if you want it. This one's about that first step across the ditch that is the Channel, or indeed the Irish Sea. First things first, why go? Well, because it's there, because, mainly because we can. We've got a magic carpet. We're general aviation pilots. Why not make full use of it? Different food, different sights, different ambiance. Um, and guess what? The tax man will even help pay for some of it. Yes, really. And hold that thought. Right. Time to cut to the chase. How hard is it really to fly to France? Well, you wake up one morning, look at the weather, decide to grab your passport, plan the flight, flight essentially as usual, uh, spend a couple of extra minutes on the Internet and go. That's essentially it. Honestly, that really is it. To fly to France, you only need to submit a flight plan. It's a legal necessity because you're crossing an international FIR boundary. That is a border. Um, but that's the paperwork on the UK side. Uh, well, on the international side that you need um, as you travel. You should wait only a little while for it to get into the computerized system um, and then off you go. There is one key Brexit change and I'll talk more about this later on, you can no longer, unfortunately, leave from just anywhere. But most airfields that were previously used to fly abroad do currently have a temporary blanket dispensation from Border Force until next year. And hopefully by then, those airfields will have applied for the relevant permissions. Um, so as I say, I'll, I'll give a bit more information about that in due course. You should know, though, uh, that you do need to enter France enter the EU via a customs and immigration airfield at their end. And most of those airfields now require some notice. The good news is you've got quite a choice. There are quite a few options along the Channel Coast um, and those are short distance inland in case the weather sc scuppers you. OK, outbound, easy, told you. Um, what about coming home again? That's a bit more complicated, but not really very much. This time you need a whole two web submissions required. Um, a flight plan, remember you're crossing a border, and a thing called a GAR, a general aviation report. That is your formal notification to customs and immigration in the UK that you're returning back into the country. There is a time constraint on this in that Border Force may wish to come and meet you um, they need to have a uh, notice to come out to the airfield if they wish. Just like on the outbound leg, you're uh, limited to arrival at a so-called certificate of agreement airfield uh, or designated airfield. More about that shortly. Um, but there should be lots about uh, lots of those around. And again, you must leave France from a customs airfield. The EU, France, they want to know. Uh, um, when you are leaving their country because they know when you've arrived. That's essentially it. Um, you now know the basics. 
so it's not that short a presentation though because there is some detail that sits under those headlines and we'll start with the boring admin stuff firstly some good news since the post brexit brief i did in the spring um due to some really sterling work um by the uk alphabet groups that's the laa bmaa aopa etc along with uh, the uk caa and dgac the french caa equivalent there has been a significant improvement in the licensing and medical combinations that the French will accept. So what does that come down to? Well, if you are flying most permit home-built or, home or historic aircraft or a microlight, France will accept you. Not only that, but for those permit and microlight aircraft, the French will now accept a LAPL or NPPL and even a UK personal medical declaration rather than uh, a class one or class two medical. That's really good news. There is a sting in the tail though. Frustratingly, if you're flying a so-called part 21 aircraft, that is an aircraft with a certificate of airworthiness, most factory built aircraft, France will not accept pilots with anything other than a PPL or higher and a class one or class two uh, medical. Um, them's the rules i'm afraid and i'm very sorry sadly they will inevitably affect several people who won't be able to go uh to france if they fly a part 21 aircraft on an nppl or a lapel um real shame real shame okay finally uh and i'll take the opportunity to do it on this slide even though it was talking about france um there is some fairly recent very good news from the channel islands who will now accept PMDs and they will accept them, um, as I understand it, for permit and for part 21 aircraft. So, oh, well, no, they sorry, I misspoke. They won't currently accept permit aircraft. They used to. They, they used to be a, uh, a dispensation for permit aircraft, but the approval expired, I think, last year. There is apparently an extension in the works, um, which is expected by AOPA Channel Islands, um, to allow permit aircraft again uh, to fly to the Channel Islands, and and you know hopefully we'll see that very soon. But certainly for the uh, for for the PMD acceptance, I think thanks go to the Channel Islands Directorate of Civil Aviation and AOPA. Okay, flight plans. In the overview, I mentioned filing a flight plan, but what exactly is a flight plan, and how does one file such a thing? Well, it's relatively simple, really. The flight plan is just the formal way uh, that you use to describe to the authorities what your aircraft is, what its identity is, its routing, and um, provide uh, people with safety information, such as how many of you are on board, what navigation equipment have you got, um, what survival equipment do you carry. Um, as I mentioned right at the beginning, it is a legal requirement to cross a border. That is an international FIR boundary, not any old FIR boundary. You don't need one, for example, from the London to the Scottish FIR, um, although uh, perhaps Nicola is working on that. There is a sequence that you go through to use a flight plan. The way I think of it is first you post it. Then you prompt somebody to read it, and then when you've finished, pop it in the bin. Or more correctly, you file it before flight. At least 30 minutes before departure is recommended, although with modern electronic systems, it's often available to air traffic services um, almost immediately. Then you open it uh, when airborne, uh, which is simply asking an appropriate uh, ATS unit such as uh, London Information, um request activate my fear of our flight plan airborne at time two two or whatever it was and you give your airborne flight time to them because uh, it might take you a while to 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 get in and get a word in edgeways with london information maybe um but you 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 provide your airborne time because the flight plan contains information re relative to that time so times on route um, to crossing the international boundary, uh, your fuel endurance, which obviously starts when you take off. Um, obviously, those things being based on where you left need a reference point. Finally, once you're on the ground, you close it uh, so that everybody knows you have arrived safely and search and rescue don't feel the need to come looking for you. Um, 
some places will allow you to close it in flight. Uh, it's better to close it on the ground. The details of filling out a flight plan are probably uh, too long-winded and boring um, to talk about here. Um, what I suggest you do is find Safety Sense Leaflet 20, um, uh, which goes into that in some detail. And um, we will see shortly that there are some computerized tools um, easily available that make it very easy and guide you through it. Now, there are some UK quirks. I know we do this differently from everybody else in the world. I can sense your astonishment from here. In the UK, it seems uniquely, it is not necessary to actively close your flight plan. If you do not close it, no big uh, yellow a UK helicopter, um, uh, I guess red and white UK helicopter nowadays, um, is going to come looking for you. The way it works in the UK is that the system expects if you don't turn up because something nasty has happened, you will have nominated, that is you personally, will have nominated a so-called responsible person to alert the emergency services and provide them with the necessary information on what routes you were taking, how many people are on board, and uh, when you left to come and find you. Um, that's hardly great, um, but you should find such a competent person and brief them accordingly. It's the UK way. I cannot say I'm a fan. Elsewhere in the world, they take unclosed flight plans very seriously. And after your estimated time of arrival, they will initiate overdue action and come looking for you. If they find you drinking at a bar with your mates, having launched expensive search and rescue for you, they will be unimpressed. And it's reported on a number of occasions that people have been charged a fee and a non-trivial fee for unnecessary call-outs like that. Often... In Europe, your landing airfield will have closed the flight plan for you automatically. Um, if there's air traffic on, uh, they, they almost certainly will have. But I recommend, strongly recommend that you check. Um, might be French lunchtime or something. If you're not sure, there is a local rate number in France. In fact, there's a local rate number in, in most European countries that you can call. They won't mind hearing the closure of the flight plan twice. And the number is in the relevant AIP, and uh, several of them are in the uh, material that I'm sharing at the end of this talk. Um, interestingly, actually, just I'll just go back a slide. Um, interestingly, in uh, 2019, on the long trip and, and a couple of other trips that year, I'd experienced in um, Germany and Poland being called by air traffic on my mobile before I'd had a chance to call them, almost as soon as I you know, opened, closed the aircraft down and opened the door. It's very heartening to know that somebody is looking out for you. Uh, and this is a good reason to include your mobile phone number in uh, in international format, you know, the plus four four at the beginning, in the remarks section of the flight plan. Um, Sky Demon, for example, makes that very easy for you. It, when you when you put your um, uh, basic details into Fly Demon at Sky Demon, for the first time, um, you're prompted to put your mobile phone number in. Um, I recommend you do that. Um, it, it can come in very handy. OK, so that's what flight plans are uh, and when to file, open and close them. But how do you actually do it? Um, you don't fax them anymore. That used to be the old fashioned way. Um, there are a number of methods these days, and I'll talk about some of the more popular ones. Firstly, NATS, National Air Traffic Services in the UK, have uh, an online tool called AFPEX, the Assisted Flight Plan Exchange. And that requires a prearranged account, uh, which is free for you for personal use. You can use it. It's a bit fiddly um, to use it on a phone or a tablet via a web browser, but you can use it. And there is contextual guidance available as you go through each of the um, uh, each of the fields. Um, I do recommend you you use that safety sense leaflet I mentioned earlier because it kind of puts it into context before you're actually faced with the um, with the form. Sadly, um, a few years ago, Nats made AFPEX inordinately expensive for airfields um, who um, in the past used to be kind enough to to um, file your flight plan for you. Um, many of them who used to provide a flight plan service for pilots now choose not to because of the cost. And therefore, you really should expect that it's up to you. But it's it's not hard anymore with, with the IT we have all available to us. Um, 
it's very frustrating that Nats did that. Um, it's another example of some UK aviation regulators knowing what my granddad would call uh, the cost of everything and the value and out. Um, and in this instance, it's a safety related system. So not great. The French have a similar uh, and I find somewhat more user friendly system um, uh, also online called Olivia. Uh, it is available in English uh, and can be used for any flight that originates or ends in France. So you could use it to go from home for a trip to, say, Calais, if you wish. Um, it's a good site. Uh, you can also access uh, note times and weather um, from the same site and actually other useful information too. And again, contextual help is available. Um, you can't actually see it here, but the yellow bar at the bottom of the, the web page um, gives you contextual help for the, uh, the field that you're on. Um, Olivia was due to be replaced earlier this year by another system called Sophia. Um, but it seems that has had teething problems. So um, Sophia has been held back. I mean, imagine that not going live with a substandard computerized aviation system. That's a novelty. Anyway, no doubt we will all get to dump poor Olivia and start dating Sophia in the reasonably near future. Nowadays, though, I suspect most people won't bother with either um, Afpex or Olivia, um, but instead they'll manage their flight plans via a phone or a tablet app such as Skydemon, um, as this screenshot is, or For Flight Runway HD. All of those um, excellent products allow you to manage flight plans. There are several advantages of doing it this way. Um, a major one for me being that once you've set up your aircraft profile uh, with the aircraft navigation equipment and the safety kit that you carry, um, and the number of people on uh, well those things you only have to do once all you have to do is um enter the number of people on board and your estimated time of departure and it will automatically populate it with your route it's ready to send at that point very very quick indeed very very easy definitely recommended okay we're going abroad Customs and immigration nowadays. French customs airfields now seem invariably to require notice of your arrival or your departure. You have to depart from a customs airfield. And if you're arriving or departing from a French European Union customs airfield um, and they require notice, you need to do that in both directions. Um, when you give notice, they might ask for information about who's on board, that sort of thing. Basically, some of the information that um, you will already be preparing to give to uh, UK Customs and Immigration. The notice periods range from two hours, Calais, Le Touquet, to nowadays, unfortunately, as much as 24 hours um, or even 48 hours at weekends and holidays. So beware. Um, you may choose to go to a slightly different airfield solely because it's got a, um, a shorter notice period, even though your routing may turn out to be a little bit longer. I strongly recommend you check the AIP entry and the NOTAMs, because the NOTAMs will sometimes tell you that there are changes to notice periods. Um, notice is normally given conveniently by email. Um, the address is uh, invariably in the AIP entry. And um, some airfields, for example, Calais, have made use of an online form. Again, I stress don't forget notices required outbound as well as inbound. Also, customs and immigration is duty free allowances. Um, post the B word, um, the duty free allowance becomes more important for us, um, particularly for things other than fags and booze. On a private flight, this allowance is less than the amount that you can bring back on ferries or the Channel Tunnel. If you're coming back on commercial transport, the allowance is £390. If you're coming back by private aircraft, you should declare anything worth more than £270 per person that you are bringing back into the country in your aircraft. So be careful, for example, with that sexy avionics suite that you are planning to buy at Aero Friedrichshafen next year. Alcohol and tobacco limits, they're the same as if you were returning via commercial surface or air transport, but they changed post-Brexit too. So if because of COVID you haven't travelled recently, just 
bear that in mind if you're thinking of bringing uh, bringing a uh, a clinking cargo back with you. Um, the and, and that's on this slide. The current duty free allowance for entering the UK is is on the slide here, which uh, which you'll see later if you wish to download it. The other thing to watch out for. Uh, and um, as you may have seen in the press, some long distance lorry drivers have fallen foul of this already, is that no meat or dairy products may be imported into the EU. So be sure to eat that ham and cheese roll as you're over the channel before you arrive at Latuke. Um, fortunately for me, we gastro Brits, it does remain legal to bring food items back into the UK. So you're OK with a uh, jambon et fromage baguette or a parcel of mysterious animal gizzards um, from a French market is when you're coming home. OK, that's customs. That's all I've got to say about that. Um, you will recall that I mentioned you need two web submissions on the way back home. The flight plan and this mysterious thing called GAR. Uh, well, we've done flight plans. The general aviation report, the GAR, is the official means by which you tell UK Customs and Immigration who you are bringing back, uh, what goods you might be bringing back with you, and where and importantly when you will ar arrive. Um, the form is easy to find. Um, Google the terms GAR and aviation, and that will take you to the appropriate gov.uk page um, where you have the option of completing the form online um, or downloading a spreadsheet which you can email later. Both of them come with instructions for use. Very straightforward. As with flight plans, the most convenient way uh, of completing and submitting the GAR, I find, just going back a page, sorry, um, uh, completing the GAR is um, Skydemon Runway HD, um, the apps. Um, Skydemon in particular uses a site, onlineguard.com, which you can also use directly. Um, uh, both of them very, very simple. The big advantage of the Sky Demon online GAR method um, uh, is that you automatically send the GAR, or it does it for you, um, to the right people. And that's a slight complication sometimes, um, which is um, uh, something which um, I've got a, a table uh, coming up the slide after this one to tell you about. This one is a slightly busy slide. Apologies for that. Um, but you may have heard sometimes as well as customs and immigration in the UK, the police, people sometimes call them special branch, although they don't exist any longer on that, under that name. Um, the police sometimes need to be informed as well. That's correct, but require, refers to the requirements under the Prevention of Terrorism Act to, uh, the words are, inform a constable if you are travelling to or from uh, the so-called common travel area. That is um, the UK, the Isle of Man, the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland, the Channel Islands. Um, because of this prevention of terrorism requirement, the Republic of Ireland, even though it's in the uh, EU, has additional rules that apply to it rather than any other EU destination. Um, so you need to be aware of that because it's a potential gotcha. Note that the notification requirement exists in both directions for the common travel area, outbound and inbound. Note also that it's a notification. It's not a request for permission. In the past, some police forces have confused this themselves, um, and they've insisted on giving pilots a supposed authorization of some sort. Um, that is wrong of them. Um, it's not necessary. You do not need to uh, permission or a receipt from them to travel. You, you don't need to wait for them to tell you anything. All you need is to notify them, and you use that by sending the same GAR form that you use to notify special branch uh, to notify customs and immigration. Um, note that the destination, so the Channel Islands, for example, requires its own paperwork. Um, uh, often you can fill that on arrival, um, but um, sometimes they would like that in advance also. Um, most of the time you're going to be arriving at a limited number of airfields anyway, certainly Channel Islands and Isle of Man. Um, so you're probably going to be uh, arriving somewhere where commercial air traffic is um, uh, commonly arriving and therefore there will be a presence um, of their police force uh, there if they want to meet you. Um, it's usually, the, the, the information that they're asking for is usually exactly the same as the general aviation report, you know, 
who you are, what aircraft you're coming in, uh, where you're going to arrive, and at what time, what you're carrying. It is straightforward. Okay, now that I've told you where and how to complete the GAR form, uh, we come to the slightly complicated bit, which is how much notice is required and to whom should that notice be sent. There are a number of combinations of who you send it to in the UK, depending on where you're going to and coming from, and the notice periods uh, change too. UK customs, UK immigration, um, and the police, if necessary, um, all have different requirements. What I've done in this table um, is to simplify the outbound and inbound tasks by identifying where the form needs to be sent and with what notice. Simply speaking, and you can study this form because you can download it from the material later because it's not particularly readable on the screen, but simply speaking, you will see in the yellow bits that the UK inbound notice periods are from the EU, except for the Republic of Ireland, remember the gotcha, four hours. From the common travel area, excluding the Republic of Ireland, uh, sorry, including, including, get it right, including the Republic of Ireland, is 12 hours. And from outside the EU and the common travel area, if, you know, there's quite a long flight from there, but you might be coming back from Switzerland, um, that's 24 hours. Outbound, the notice periods for the UK um, are to the EU, except Ireland, not the Irish Republic, not required. So the GAR form does have the option for you to put outbound um, information on there. Um, that's because it's required for going to the common travel area and it's required for going to non-EU, non-common travel area destinations. If you fill it in going to the EU and send it off, nobody's going to be worried. You just don't strictly need to. This table, as I say, is a simplified version of what you actually need to do if you're following the rules absolutely strictly, but in the safe sense. In some cases, if you use this table, you will end up sending the form to an organisation that may strictly not demand it. But this way, it ensures that those who do will definitely get it. And it's a little bit easier, I think anyway, to remember um, what's in this table rather than the strictly correct version. If you want the strictly correct version, um, that's in the material you can download as well as this simplified table, if you wish it. Okay. you need now is which airfields for EU airfields you must arrive and depart at a customs and immigration field. There are some recent changes now that we are beyond the Brexit transition period, which ended on the 31st of December 2020, so far as the UK is concerned. And I touched on this earlier. For flights to or from the EU, you may now only travel to or from a so-called designated or certificate of agreement airfield. Um, that always used to be the case for the Channel Islands, um, but it applies now to EU destinations as well. And what are they? Well, a designated airfield, um, you may not have to give notice because there may well be uh, a permanent presence, but you still need a GAR. Um, uh, you could fill it in um, at the airfield if you want, since there's potentially no notice required. Um, they tend to be the bigger airfields. Um, and a certificate of agreement airfield is... Um, or airport, strictly, um, is um, in that list which you absolutely uh, cannot read. Um, but again, um, it's in the slides. I put it up there to remind myself to tell you that it exists. Remember, you can find that guidance material simply by Googling GAR and aviation, and also by downloading the, the material in my link later. Um, you used to be able to fly from what they called an other place, i.e. that something which is not designated or certificate of agreement, a farm strip. You can't do that any longer. You need to know that. But the good news is uh, that there is an automatic interim solution, inter interim approval from Border Force for many of those strips. If the strip, um, farm strip airfield had been used for international travel in the year uh, 12 months prior to June 2020, 
then the strip owner or operator should have received a letter from Border Force granting a blanket interim certificate of agreement, which lasts until the end of June next year. After June 2022, each airfield or strip that does wish to conduct international travel in either direction um, will need its own specific certificate of agreement. However, it's not too onerous to apply for that, and you can apply now, or your airfield airstrip uh, owner uh, operator can apply now. I have recently completed the application on behalf of uh, on behalf of the owner of the strip that I fly from, um, and I can tell you it's not onerous. It took me less than a morning to complete. Border Force were very helpful. In fact, they've been very proactive with this um, from the outset. Um, really quite good. They will uh, happily visit you um, to advise before you attack the form. Uh, well, I assume they still will. They certainly were earlier this year. You might want to check um, with your airfield or strip owner that they're aware of this. Um, certainly the owner of my strip, my strip, um, had the letter and he was very happy to have somebody else do the donkey work of dealing with the Border Force visit and completing with the application for him to sign. As I say, just a few hours to do it. Uh, not a big deal. Doesn't ask for anything too difficult. Okay, so that's um, how you do the paperwork um, to inform people what you're up to. Um, that is how you choose where you can or maybe cannot fly from and to. Now we're ready to go. So you want to collect all the information and documents that you need to take with you. And that's what we'll talk about now. Um, personal wise for yourself and your passengers, well, you'll want your pilot's license. You'll want your IT li uh, your RT license, not your IT license. Um, I could do one of those with the uh, with the IT faffs I'm making tonight. Um, you want your aircrew medical or a PMD statement if you're going to France or the Channel Islands, um, France in a permanent aeroplane. You remember, um, and your passport. Um, there are some changes on expiry dates. Hold that thought. Uh, and um, if you have a uh, a UK issued EASA license, um, I do, I, 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 I had some ratings, so got a, a, a license that's got EASA written on the front, um, you need a form called a CAP 2086, and I'll explain that in a minute. And um, with COVID, you'll need a passenger locator form for everybody on the aircraft, uh, and um, you'll need to book tests, I'll talk about that at the end. Um, the passport and the CAP 2086 are uh covid changes um so i'll talk about that in a moment for the aircraft so that's what you need for the humans for the aircraft um you need to take what's on the list on this slide and i'll, I'll just pick a couple to talk about um you need the certificate of airworthiness if your aircraft is a c of a aircraft if your aircraft is a permit aircraft take the permit to fly and take the validity document that that you get each year from your um, approving organization, LAA, BMAA. If your aircraft has a pilot's operating handbook or um, aircraft flight manual, um, you uh, should take that too. Um, not all permit aircraft have those or are required to have those, um, but if you're required to have one, you need to take it. And a journey log. Now, when I first saw that, I thought, what on earth is a journey log? Um, uh, and I guess some of you may be asking the same question. It's quite basic. It takes a little bit of searching out to find out what it is, um, but it's simply a log of basic information, uh, such as where you've flown to or from, what date, um, what crew, uh, who, was the, who was the captain, uh, what flight times, any observations. And, and what we've done since we've now made one up is we also use it to keep a, a handy single point log of what fuel and oil uplift we have. Both EKO and EASA um, suggest the contents of a journey log, and I've included a copy of what they say in a PDF um, in my shared documents. We use just a simple small notebook with appropriate columns. We definitely do not use the aircraft or personal logbooks. Um, I'm, in my opinion, those should always stay safely on the ground. And the, fast, the, the last thing to note is a copy of the interception procedures just in case you get your own personal air show and a, uh, a French Air Force um, Armée de l'Air uh, Rafale hangs off your wingtip, um, starts making funny move movements, um, you need to know what to do. Uh, it's a legal requirement to carry that. And um, the easiest way to do it is uh, uh, to download CAA Safety Sense Leaflet 11. 
Annoyingly, that's been withdrawn from the um, from the official CAA website. But guess what? There's a PDF copy in um, the the documents that I'm sharing um, in a bit. Right, passports. I mentioned there'd been a change with passports. Um, there has been a change in uh, passport validity since 31st of December 2020. Um, you need to be aware of this. On the dra on the day that you travel, your passport should have at least six months validity left and it should be less than 10 months 10 years old 10 years old um most passports are 10 year passports i think but there are some passports that have a number of extra months validity there um but even though it says they're valid if it is uh, not less than 10 years old it isn't um so it's a bit of a gotcha you need to watch out for that um I don't know why you'd think if it says it's valid, it's valid, um, but apparently not. Then again, as ever, are the rules. And the other thing I want to say, take the opportunity to say here, it's not a legal requirement. It's just handy information. Um, the a positive thing is that if you hold a current European health insurance card um, that you got you know, last year or, or previously, um, an EHIC, it will still be honoured until its expiry in Europe. There is a UK replacement um, called the Global Health Insurance Card, the GHIC, and that will in the future also be accepted in the EU. Um, interestingly, though, even though you've got one of those, the government do recommend individual health insurance for everybody on board. Worth knowing about that. Licenses, uh, again, gets a little bit... Uh, complicated here for many of us who are carrying PPLs and LAPLs um, that were issued when the UK was still a member of EASA. Therefore, those documents um, say EASA on the front, even though they strictly aren't any longer. Um, they are UK FCL licenses in the parlance. The more pedantic and knowledgeable gendarme may take issue with this, but you, you, you Brits are no longer in EASA anymore. Why, why is this valid? Um, so to protect you against that, um, the CAA, uh, again, proactively, um, have produced this document, CAP 2086, which they encourage you to download, uh, to print and carry with your license. It's one page, one side of A4. Very, very simple. Um, downloadable from the CAA website. Just search for CAP 2086. Um, you don't need to log in for this one, um, unlike many of the other things on that site. It's a blanket confirmation from the CAA to whomever it may concern, that previous UK-issued EASA licenses and medicals, actually, um, remain valid. Um, there's a copy of this document in the material I'll share with you later. Um, and very many thanks are due to Irv Lee, which is why I've put his banner along the bottom there, for highlighting that, because it is a possible gotcha, um, and it's not particularly well understood. Um, probably most of the time, the gendarmes just look at your license and be happy. But just on that occasion when they don't, you might be glad you've actually got a printed version of this tucked in your license wallet. OK, that's paperwork. Safety equipment. Um, what safety equipment must I legally carry? Well, a personal locator beacon or an emergency locator transmitter. The difference is one's attached to you. The ELT is attached to the aircraft. Um, you need one of those and all occupants must have life jackets. Those are as far as the legal requirements go, but you might want to give some thought as to what else you might want to have available if the worst that sh should happen. For example, you and your passengers, in my opinion, should not only have life jackets available, you should very much be wearing them. Putting them on in a cramped cockpit whilst dealing with an emergency is not really going to be feasible. Um, CA Safety Sense Leaflet 21 on ditching is a slightly depressing read. Um, but it will give you food for thought, and it's a mine of useful information. Um, I am developing another webinar, um, if anybody's interested, um, that will consider the safety and survival for, for flights over water, flights out, out of the UK. Um, that webinar is absolutely not intended to worry you. Um, it is intended to give you confidence that you and your passengers can be as well informed and as well prepared as you can be. Okay. Now may be uh, the time to mention some other challenges you may come up against. Although, to be honest, 
these are not so much to do with flying abroad than than those you might find on on any long trip really um including maybe if you decided to go to the fabulous western isles of scotland um and since i mentioned it if you do do that um many people will tell you that you absolutely must go and visit brendan and allison at the glenforce hotel on mole um those people are not wrong but i'll say no more about that because that's not not about flying abroad that's flying to gorgeous mole okay um what are some of the challenges this is by no means an exhaustive list gps moving maps obviously they make navigation um very easy we know that already um but you're often asked to uh, report the FIR boundary. Ooh, where's that? Well, it's on the moving map. And in fact, you can drop a waypoint on it um, in advance if you want. Um, it gives you an easy ETA to the uh, to the FIR boundary if you're asked for that. Um, and uh, with Skydemon, Poor Flight, Runway HD, those apps, um, you don't have to carry an armful of paper charts either, um, or even the, uh, the AIP for the countries that you're visiting. Um, you uh, will find find um, that they are downloadable in the Sky Demon, Sky Demon documents paid, um, really helpful. Um, and also for the individual airfields, if you press and hold on the airfield, just as you would do in the UK, um, information comes up and you can look at the AIP entry there. Um, and that will give you information such as the notification email address, for example, um, uh, and opening hours, notification periods, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. What did we do with our apps? Um, the next thing to think about is danger areas. There are several over the channel, certainly um, sort of west of Shoreham, west of the Isle of Wight. Um, well, actually a little bit east of the Isle of Wight in cases. Um, the long crossings from further west than there um, will definitely uh, have you looking at danger areas and thinking, what do I do? Usually with a, only a little bit of forward planning, crossing them is not an issue. You can phone Plymouth Military, who manage most of those danger areas in advance, to check if they're going to be active at your planned time of flight um, and to get an indication of whether you will be able to get a crossing service. Usually the answer is yes, uh, in my experience. Sometimes they're shooting, um, so you can't. You know, have to go round. Um, sometimes they'll give you a height band that's a little bit higher than you were originally planning, and you may have to climb. But very useful, very friendly, um, very Wilco people. Um, Definitely don't be worried about talking to them. The phone number is on the chart and in Sky Demon, et cetera. Um, and you can also get status uh, from London Information and a danger area crossing service from Plymouth Military, frequencies on the chart, um, or London Information when you're in flight. Um, weather? Yeah, well, we all know about flying with weather, don't we? Although flying over water has a couple of other additional hazards. Um, if it's very hazy, you lose the horizon, uh, can be a bit nasty. So watch out for those goldfish bowl effects. Um, flying high, uh, not again wishing to teach anybody to suck eggs, but flying high often reduces the haze and you may want to be high anyway um, in case of any aircraft issues. Um it's an advantage, I guess, to go high if you start your trip from somewhere slightly inland rather than a coastal airfield. Um, uh, obviously, you're less likely to have a delayed departure due to coastal weather effects and you're climbing at high power over the land. Um, it's a bit confidence building to do that, I find sometimes. Um, so, yeah, weather, surface references, danger areas, navigation, unfamiliar airspace once you get to the other side. Um, this is very much a, uh, a concern that uh, many people talk about. That French chart looks very daunting. It is apparently utterly covered in red restricted areas. And often when you look at the NOTAMs, there are massive NOTAMs that appear to cover, you know, radiuses of tens, tens of miles. Um, but in fact, it's not anywhere near as bad as it looks. Uh, I do have another webinar in preparation that covers those things and more for flying further into Europe than the Channel Coast if you want it. But the headline is essentially not all of those red areas are active all the time. There is a relatively easy and handy place to look on the French flight planning websites that tell you what's active and what's not. And also there are hints and tips about dealing with those apparently enormous French notans, um, mainly um, they uh, refer to uh, uh, an air information circular, which when you look at it, you think, oh, why did they do that? There's one or two tiny areas, but they're so far apart and have been covered in one NOTAM that the effective area looks far, far bigger than, than, than it ever is. 
um, the French are, are uh, commonly doing that. It's frustrating, but once you know what, what they're doing, uh, you don't worry about it quite so much. Okay. Flying challenges, more than enough about that. Uh, some good news now. It's been a while. Some of you may remember way, way back at slide three, I said that those awfully nice people at the Inland Robbery are prepared to give you money back if you fly abo abroad. Um, it's difficult to believe. It really is. But it's true. Uh, exporting hydrocarbon fuel in an aircraft, even a private aircraft, to the EU or the Channel Islands entitles you to claim a refund of the fuel duty paid. Um, no, this is excise duty. It's not VAT as some people uh, on um, uh, social media sometimes incorrectly say, um, it's known as drawback, and it is absolutely not to be sniffed at. Even better news, it is not the amount that you use for the flight. So if you go on um, the short crossing, say Lid to Latuke, it's not just the amount of fuel that it takes you to do those uh, 20 miles or so. It applies to the entire amount in your tanks when you take off to leave the UK even if you bring it some of it back again. Now, they are wise to this. Um, um, you need to have burnt it back in the UK or not claim um, if you go back to the EU again. Um, but for that for that uh, cycle of going for the first time, um, exporting hydrocarbon fuel that hasn't previously been exported to the EU, you can get some money back. And uh, the rate's pretty good. It's not to be sniffed at. Um, Avgas... 38p a litre. Mogas, nearly 58p a litre. Um, the poor people who fly uh, Jet A1 aircraft only get 11p a litre. So do remember to keep your fuel upli uplift receipts for the claim form. And they'll also ask you when the last time was that that aircraft went to Europe. That's to stop you doing that you know, double dipping. Um, some of you may remember my... Um, post-Brexit webinar back in, in March um, when this subject came up. Um, I don't intend any public maths this time. Um, it was a uh, Dave debacle last time. I'm not going to do that again. Um, but it could be a nice little lunch for two, um, the, 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 the drawback um, for a full tank of fuel. Right. Getting close to the end now. Um, so we talk about COVID. Um, I say again, these are the rules today. Um, they can change at a whim, as we are all painfully aware. Um, uh, you need to know what to do, though. And um, this is the headlines for France, for France today. OK, if you're travelling to France, everyone on the aircraft must be double vaccinated. Um, you need proof of that. The NHS app is one proof. Um, I think the little snippet I've got there of the app is the wrong one. It's the NHS app, not the NHS COVID-19 app, the one that's got your medical record on it. Um, and there's a QR code um, on that app um, if you've probably properly logged in um, that shows that you've been double jabbed. Um, I believe the French uh, systems, I, I've not been to France since um, since COVID, unfortunately, um, but I believe from people who have that the French systems will read those QR codes on the NHS app and it's acceptable to them. You need a sworn statement for everybody on board um, that you don't have COVID symptoms and you've not been in contact with confirmed cases. Um, easily downloadable, that form. You need to take it with you uh, and you need everybody needs to have signed it. And you should also um, think about the, the French equivalent of the app that uh, I, my pronunciation is going to be even worse than it has been when I've attempted French earlier in this webinar, but to anti-COVID um, is the app. You can find it on the Apple App Store. You can find it on Google Play. Um, download it, set it up. Um, the French are used to it. Um, it'll make uh, life um, easier for you. Now, what about returning to the UK? Again, these are the rules today. Um, they can change at any time. France is currently uh, on the amber list for the UK, but for people who've been double vaccinated, which basically you need to have been to have entered France in the first place from the uh, from the UK, the rules are the same as for travel from a green country. And that is, you must all complete a passenger locator form. Remember, I mentioned that before, um, uh, before you travel. So um, don't expect to be completing that on your arrival in the UK. Before you travel, you need to complete and submit that. You can do it online. Um, 
you will need proof of a negative lateral flow test taken within three days of your return to the UK. So if you're doing a day trip, you do it in the UK before you go. Uh, and um, if you've got a child under 10, they are exempt from that. But but after your return, you need to take a PCR test within two days uh, on or before the second day after landing is the way it's said. Um, and that does include children over five. If you have children between five and 10 um, and they have got to have a PCR test, I sympathize with you. Um, like many of you, I've had one of those. It's horrible. Um, it won't be fun and the kids won't like it at all. OK, that's it for COVID uh, um, or certainly a COVID overview anyway. Um, I will recap uh, and then we can go to questions if you have them. Just before I do, um, just to say the, the COVID rules um, are for France and actually for many other European countries um, are in a very, very handy um, web, uh, sorry, online uh, document, which is hosted on Google Docs that Carl Meek um, from the Flyer Forum has produced. It's really good. It's very clear. Um, I'll put a link to that in the comments later on. Um, these last two slides, very much based on that information, um, checked with the government with the government websites. Um, not surprisingly, Carl's got it spot on. Okay. To recap, um, we can go to questions then if you have them. Outbound from the UK, you need to leave uh, at least from a certificate of agreement airfield. Um, it's important to remember that you can't go from any old farm strips, although many of them do have a blanket interim uh, certificate until July 2022. Uh, and airfields are encouraged by Border Force, who will help to apply for your own certificate of agreement before then. You need to file a flight plan um, if you're going to the common travel area. So not France, common travel area. You need an outbound GAR and don't forget 12 hours notice. Be aware of the requirements of your destination country. Um, European airfields, we've talked about this. They often have a PPR notice period and you must land at a customs and immigration airfield. And make sure that you take those necessary documents and equipment. For our aircraft, we have a folder of copies ready to go, which makes it easy um, arguably easy to forget everything at once, um, but no, not really. Um, we keep that folder in the aircraft. Returning to the airfield, again, your destination now must have at least a certificate of agreement. You can't just land anywhere um, coming back anymore. Uh, you uh, need a flight plan again, uh, international air fire boundary, and you need a GAR. Regardless of where you're coming from, you need a GAR. Um, it just goes to different people and has different notification periods. Remember that yellow table earlier. You must leave Europe from a customs airfield. So again, don't forget their possible notice periods. Don't forget that some places have that nasty 48 hours notice if you're coming back at weekends or on French holidays. Um, so you may need to contact them if you've been Traveling in France, you may need to contact them um, a couple of days before you're even thinking about cross-channel uh, um, uh, flight. Um, or you may need to contact them before you leave your hotel or another airfield further into Europe, wherever you happen to be. Just do think about those notice periods because they are a real gotcha. And it's very easy to forget that you need the notice periods outbound. Oh, I find so anyway. Um, have the legally required personal locator beacon or uh, emergency locator transmitter, as well as life jackets for everyone, which they should wear. Consider other safety mitigations, including planning for the worst. That water will be cold. You might want to consider an emergency. You might want to consider a dinghy. Read the ditching safety sense leaflet um, and give it some thought. And don't forget to claim your fuel duty drawback. It's free money. So that's it. We've essentially got to the end. Um, this slide pack is available at the link provided on the slide. I will put that in the YouTube comments shortly. Um, and the link includes um, other material. There is in the, the documents that, as well as the documents I've already mentioned, um, there's a simple write-up, there's a simple aid memoir that covers much of what's uh, on this slide pack. Um, you can also get that if you forget um, to look at the slides, look at my Fly Forum signature block. Um, for those of you who frequent that often helpful, sometimes entertaining, uh, frequently frustrating place. 
Um, also, the GAR requirements table, the official GAR guidance material, copy of safety sense leaflets, copy of the CAP 2086 confirmation of validity, um, some useful web links, actually, including Carl Meek's really, really good um, COVID uh, form and some other stuff that Carl's got on there for French Customs Airfields. Um, some useful web links, several more goodies. Um, also, as I mentioned, if you want more information on flying further into France or the safety stuff, um, dealing with all the red, red on French charts, um, let me know. Let uh, let Johnny know. Um, uh, say something in the comments. Um, if you don't want it, tell, tell me that as well. So back to Johnny. Um, if there are any questions yeah. I can answer. Um, yeah, we've got one quick one from um, Tim, Joe Del Flyer. Uh, one of our aircraft had problems returning to the UK recently when they couldn't include our airship in the COVID passenger locator form. Has the form changed now? Do you know that? Mm, I don't know the answer to that. Um, because I've not done it, um, I, um, I'll i have a look at the passenger locator form uh, and see. Um, I assume from that is a drop-down menu. Um, I don't know whether they've chosen things um, uh, from maybe the certificate agreement list that presumably Border Force are holding. Um, for airfields that don't have an ICAO locator, for the flight plan and the GAR form, you can put ZZZZ and then the name of the strip um, or the postcode of the strip. I don't know whether it's possible to do that um, uh, for the passenger locator form as well. Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll look. I'll have a look. Cool. Uh, and when are you planning on going abroad next? Well, as soon as my aircraft is um, uh, is serviceable, um, unfortunately, we need uh, we need a bit of tender loving care to the engine, um, mm -hmm. and there's an enormous waiting time for that. Um, but as soon as I can, I guess realistically, given the waiting times we're looking at, um, I won't be able to again until just before Christmas, which means probably spring. Yeah, um, and then David. Buchanan says, is there a reliable and accurate COA list for France? Uh, certificate of Agreement Airfield at list. Uh, no, there isn't um, that I'm aware of. The The Certificate of Agreement Airfield list that's on the back of the GAR guidance form is well out of date. Um, it includes airfields like Plymouth, um, which hasn't been around for many a long time. Um, the, um, the list, I'm hoping, is going to be updated um, by border force once everybody's put their applications in i suspect that they wouldn't bother to do that until after july 2022 sorry june 2022 um when um the applications should go in um the application should be going in now um next time i speak to them i will ask that question Bad. good stuff yeah. um and what, what do you normally bring back with you in terms of con not contraband but what, what's your... <laughs> um, well, I, I'm 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 a bit of an anti-fag person, um, but um, a, a bit of you know French grape juice, um, lovingly mm -hmm. prepared over um, a couple of years, um, is always worth bringing home. And um, if I've remembered the cool box, I'll 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 often bring some lovely seafood as well. Lovely, sounds good. That's a really good reason to go across. <laughs> well, it, it is, isn't it? Really, uh, that and the sunshine. <laughs> yeah, fab. Okay. Um, I don't think there's any more comments, so we'll wrap it up. But if you do have any, you can always post them in the um, actual video comments as soon as the stream ends, and we can send them for, forward them to Dave. Um, but, yeah, thank you, everybody, for watching, and thank you, Dave. Pleasure. Um, just if you enjoyed it, um, I hope you did. Um, it was a pleasure from this end. Fabulous. Thank you very much. And um, I did post the tiny URL link in the comments for people who need it. I saw that. So okay. what I'm going to do now is take my airfield bottle opener and my bottle of Stella Artois and, uh, <laughs> and, and I will um, uh, celebrate completing this for you all. Thank you. Well deserved. Thank you, Dave. See you all soon. Au revoir.